Hi there, thanks for stopping by. In today's video, I'm going to revisit an old subject, dorset ring buttons. My first video on how to make a basic dorset ring button is a very old video. And of course, over the years, I've had feedback about changing the thread or zooming in closer and other little things to help you understand how to make the button. So I thought, let's update this video, take on all of those um, ideas on board and see if I can come up with a new video that's a bit clearer for you. And if you hang on, at the end, I'll show you how to make a different dorset ring button, um, a pattern from my book, Dorset Ring Buttons. So let's get started. Okay, so a dorset ring button. Clearly, you're going to need a ring. Traditionally, these days anyways, the rings tend to be rings with a slightly rounded profile. Um, early dorset buttons were so fine that they possibly didn't have much of a rounded profile. It's very difficult to tell. I'll go into that in a little bit of detail in a bit. You'll need your thread, a tapestry needle, some beeswax, possibly, and scissors. Now I've wound my thread onto one of our dorset button shuttles, which is just to help you um, work the covering part. If you haven't got those, you can just use a long length of thread threaded singly onto your needle, and we'll go through that shortly. I'll just move the scissors out of the way so they don't make lots of noise every time I move them on the table. Now, beeswax. When I first started teaching button making, I decided that it was easier for a lot of people, and I learned this through the different courses that I gave, if you rub the metal ring with a bit of beeswax before you start. This stops your threads from slipping, particularly the initial thread. And that um, gives beginners a lot more confidence if their thread's not slipping all over the place. Take the end of your thread, okay, so I'm gonna come up close now so that you can see what I'm doing. Take the end of your thread, hold it at the back of the ring. As I said, if you don't have a shuttle, this will be a needle. I want you to just sort of hold it at the back, go through the ring and cover over that start of thread, okay? So let's get up as close as we can whilst it's still in focus. Now, if you have trouble doing that, tie the end onto the ring. You're not gonna really notice and it'll probably be easier for you. So each cover stitch is basically a blanket stitch. We're going a blanket stitch around the ring. So we're going through and then up through that loop and I'm still holding on to the end of the thread. I'm gonna cover that over a few times. So if I show you at the back, I'm just covering it over. So I'll do that a few times and that will just help hide the end. So slow that up, going through the ring and through that loop and coming up, you see that's the blanket stitch loop right there and then pulling up. So you get a ridge forming and keep that ridge along the edge, okay? I'm just gonna trim off that tail now so it doesn't get in my way. And then I'm gonna basically carry on covering the ring. Now I'm using a, a large ring 
This is about an inch, um, which isn't always so easy to find these days that don't have a really fat profile, but that's okay. You can use just about any ring that you want. The secret is, is to make sure that your ring is actually a closed ring. If it isn't, when you get to that point where the join is, your threads will slip out. Now there are ways of um, cheating that. If you've got a particular size ring or a particular type of ring that you really want to cover. Um, but where possible, I would just go with a closed ring. It's much easier. What you have to do is take into consideration the ring material and your thread with regards to its final use. If you're making decorative uh, dorset buttons that you want to use, say for instance, for jewelry, or you want to use it to work as a, a book journal binding, then you obviously you can use a wooden ring, you can use um, sort of unfinished metal rings that might otherwise rust. You can basically do whatever you want. You could use cardboard rings if you wanted to stack up pieces of card. But if you're going to use, you want your button to be able to be washed, then you need to use something washable. And that's why a metal ring is traditionally used and initially cotton thread and uh, initially linen thread and then cotton. And that's because originally dorset buttons were primarily white, they were small, and they were for undergarments, and they were meant to be washed, and they were meant to be to go through a mangle, and you know, serious cleaning sort of thing. So you'll notice as I'm covering, just to sidetrack, I'm pushing up as close as I can. I don't want any of that ring to show if I can help it. I want it keep it nice and close. Also, you can see how that's starting to kink. That is going to happen because of the uh, blanket stitch. So what you need to do now, anytime you start to get your threads kinking, just hold it up and let it dangle. And you can see the twist is all coming out of the thread now. Okay, I'll just do that every once in a while and that will stop you getting knots while you're working your covering. Now, as I was saying, the original dorset buttons as an industry were there to make very, very practical buttons. These weren't highly colored. These weren't really decorated. Um, there is a, there's tradition that there were hundreds and hundreds of different designs, but you do tend to see the same few. A lot of what we call traditional designs nowadays are from um, a much later period in time, uh, not from the very early period. It is believed, tradition has it, that the rings were first used in the Dorset industry around about um, 1730, thereabouts. I just want to show you, in between all of this covering, some original dorset buttons. So you can see, in comparison to size, what I mean. So obviously, if you're going to work your finest dorset buttons, you need a really fine ring and you need a really fine thread. If you're going to work something bigger and more modern for today, then you can use sort of fat threads, you can use yarns, you can use anything that you wish. But if you want to go with the sort of traditional dorsets, the earliest seem to be the smallest. And they're a challenge. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and carry on 
covering this. And I'll see you in a little bit. So here I am, very, very nearly finished. And I just realized that I didn't say that this covering is traditionally known as casting. I'm just going to finish off the last bit. And I don't know if you can see what I'm actually doing as well with the holding. It occurred to me as I was working quickly. If you hold out, it doesn't matter if you're left or right handed, whichever direction you want to work. If you hold out the, the working thread from the ring with your two fingers and then put your needle or your shuttle through, you can find that loop a lot more quickly, but what you're also doing is you're holding the tension. And um, so that will help you to get a nice even covering. So I'm gonna go right up. And now I'm gonna cut a long length from this spool, this shuttle. About an arm's length. I will probably need, I'm gonna change colors so that you can see what I'm doing a bit more. So each time I change, when I change the colors, you will be able to see how you can add um, thread on if you need it. Don't worry about sort of always having this full amount of thread on your needle because the chances are, especially if you're working large with a finer thread as I am, it's not going to be that easy to work with long lengths of thread. I mean, that's partially why the shuttles, we've, we've created the shuttles. So we want to lock the stitches now. Okay. So there's the last stitch. There's the first stitch. You can go under the first or the second. You could even do the third. It doesn't really matter. But what you want to do is just take your needle, your threaded needle through one of those first stitches just to lock. And that will just help to keep them on the ring from going um, loose and having a lump at the edge of your ring. Okay, so that is our covered ring with the ridges along the edge thereabouts. So the next thing that we want to do is we want to do the slicking. Now slicking is the act of moving the ridge to the back of the button. Some people move it to the center of the button. It's entirely up to you, but traditionally it tends to be, uh, or on the older buttons, it tends to be to the back so that it's not seen at all. Now you can use your nail and just sort of push them back or you can use a slicker tool, um, which you can use to just catch the ridge, which is a bit more helpful than your um, using your nail, or something else that is hard, and we'll move it over. We do have slicker tools, not white. The white one is for me to show up better on screen. <laughs> um, we do them with a buttonhole gauge as well. You see that didn't show up very well in the green glass finish at the moment. And that just helps save your fingers, your hands a little bit to just pull that edge over, particularly if you've got a really nice tight tension. You can sometimes sit, find that, you know, it's just pushing into your nails a bit too much. I believe that because they've used a slicker and a slicker tool is something that's used in leatherworking to make things a bit shiny, I suspect that originally slicking was not just to do with the ridge but also to uh, burnish the um, linen a bit because a lot of them have very burnished linen. Um, edges and finishes to it. So there may well be something in that that it's more that the whole process was more akin to leatherworking slicking than just 
turning the ridges over. So now we are ready to lay the spokes, okay? Now with a basic cartwheel or um, wheel or cross wheel or wh whatever you may have learnt it as, you can have any number of spokes. It's not, it, it's not easy to say to you, oh, go ahead and only do this many spokes or only do that many spokes. It tends to be proportional to the ring so that you make something that looks nice, but you may want lots of spokes. You may only want a few spokes. Just remember that if you're using a fine thread and your spokes are too far spread out, you may have difficulty in keeping your filling stitches nice and even, okay? So I'm gonna come down I've got my thread at the top, at the back. Hold the ring at the edge. I'm going to come down the back, straight in the middle, and then work up. Okay, so that is one um, wrap, which will be two spokes. I'm going to rotate ever so slightly. Now, because I'm holding, I'm right-handed, I'm rotating anti-clockwise. If you are left-handed, you will need to sort of work all of this differently. I'll try to show you later. I'm not as great at doing dorsets um, left-handed as I am with some other buttons that I can work out left-handed. So I'm just gonna turn it ever so slightly. And I'm gonna repeat. And Lay another wrap, and again, central. And then another. And I'm just gonna keep going. I want to have this full of spokes and pretty even. Now I'm a little bit out there. I can see there's a bit of a bigger space there than there is there. So I've got two options. I can start it again because I need to really turn it towards me like that so that I can get it nice and even, or I can tweak. I think we'll try to get it as even as possible and I'll keep checking it. So down the center, slight rotation. Move that out the way so you can see better. And I can already see that I've lined this up much better this time. Okay, so now I have one, two, three, four, five, six. So I've laid six wraps and that will be 12 spokes because a spoke is counted from the center out. Okay. Now it looks a real mess at the moment, doesn't it? So what we have to do now is center. That was laying. Now we need to center. So I'm going to come up from the back and we'll place some stitches across those spokes to get them lined up. And I can push them, helpful if I don't actually let go though, um, I can push them around so that I can adjust them and make sure that they're centered. This is probably the one thing that people find sort of the most uh, difficult is getting their spokes lined up and they worry about it. Don't worry about it, just do your best. Sometimes they'll be great, sometimes they won't be so great, and it doesn't really matter. You can tweak as much as you like, and it's no point getting hepped up about it until you don't enjoy making buttons. You wanna make sure that you enjoy it. Because we can, we're not being paid piecework. 
like those poor cottage workers who made the first ones. So there we are, pretty much centered. Okay, now what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change the thread color so that you can see what I'm doing for the next stage, and that's the filling stitches. So in order to do that, now is a really good time to change is I'm just going to thread through at those cross stitches at the back. So that will hook them on there, a little bit of a tweak if I want, and then make a little bit of a knot. Basically, there's a few ways that you can add colors, but a lot of people like to just fasten right at the center. As I said, there is no real traditional way of adding colors because changing the colors in this way was not something that was done. I'm just going to trim that off. All right, so let's get my next color. Okay, so I have my next color threaded singly onto a needle and I've tied a little knot in the end taking my button up, the back of my button, at the center, I'm just going to come up, I'm just going to go through that central, those central cross stitches, just to catch that on, let's see, just to catch that, and then turn around to the front. Now we're going to work what's known as a rounding back stitch. So, Basically, I'm going to come up through one of these. These. I'm going to go back over the spoke. Now, when I go over the spoke, I'm going over the one at the top and the one at the bottom because basically we're going to connect the two of them to make a nice strong filling for the button. So I've come backward around it. Then I'm going to come up at the next space. So not the one I came up a moment ago, but the next space. And this is going to be difficult to see at the center of the button because everything's so close together. It doesn't matter how big I work it, it's still going to be a bit more difficult to see. So I will carry around, keep working it, and then we will as I get further out, it will become clearer, just in case you're a little lost. So I'm going back around the one I just came up. So at each time you're going around the spokes. So up, and then back around the spoke. Up, back around the spoke. So basically what I'm doing is I'm covering the spokes. Okay. So those of you who um, are familiar with my Yorkshire button videos, if you have never made a dorset button, you're basically working the same thing but in space. So I'm going to work a few rows so that I can spread it out a bit and then I'll come back to this so that you can actually see what's going on a little bit more clearly because you're not right smack in the center of the uh, ring. Okay, so I've done a few more uh, rounds. And basically, I just keep working around and around and around, hence it being known as a round. You can refer to it as a row if you prefer. Very much the same thing when you're working on a circle. Okay, so hopefully it'll be a little clearer to see what I'm doing because we're a little further out from the center. Come up alongside a spoke. and then go back down on the other side of the same spoke. And then move to the next spoke along. Okay. 
and then you carry on in that way. Now, I'm just going to put it in a little bit of a better position again for myself and show you how I tend to hold when I'm working. As you can see, my thumb is at the center and my finger is at the back. Now, the finger at the back is actually holding this thread and it's helping to get the tension there. Sorry, my needles just come undone, just as I'm going to show you. Right. Your thumb, you do have to be careful. Obviously, if you're using a light color, you wanna make sure that it's clean, but you do have to be careful that you're not sort of dislodging anything with your thumb or moving it. And that's particularly important when you're working patterns. But if you can keep a finger behind, it helps you to um, get a good tension. What I'm also doing is I'm sort of snapping as I get around that spoke. Um, that's a harder thing to describe, but it's also helping to make sure that I pull in and get the tension. So as soon as I change to show you, then my tension changes a bit and it, it gets a little bit fatter around the spoke. So it's a good idea to find a, something that you're comfortable with that will continue to uh, hold that thread as you need it. And again, the same as when you were covering the ring, as you start to get a kink, hold up and let the whole thing spin to get any excess twist out of your thread. So I'm gonna carry on a bit longer and start filling this up. I'm getting a, quite a short piece of um, thread. So I know that with this rather large ring, I'm not going to be able to fill it entirely up with the thread that I chose. So here is a way um, to either add more thread or to change your thread color, which obviously opens up all sorts of design possibilities. I tend, because of the way that the thread holds, I quite like going down to the center. Now, of course, that leaves a line that you may not like. And depending on the use of your button, if you're trying to make a really nice double-sided button, you may wish to cover that over. So you can bring your thread to the end and then your subsequent wrapping will cover up that thread. Um, but because for me, that pulls away which you can barely see, it pulls away a little bit. I just tend to prefer to go to the center. So I just find it easier and I'm more worried about what the front of the button looks like. So I will go to the center and then not. But as I say, if I want to do something that's sort of really double-sided and really careful, then I would take it to the edge and then add on the next thread that would then cover up the first thread. So, I mean, you could stop there, but traditionally you should go as close to the edge as possible because that's what's going to give you your wheel. So let's get some more thread. As you can see, working a smaller thread and a larger ring is taking more time, um, which means, you know, it's gonna, you're not gonna get as many done as if you were working the small historic ones. But when this, I mean, the smallest I have is about four or five millimeters across, um, you do manage to fill that up rather quickly. So, Again, I tend to like to just fasten into the center again, just as I did before. But as I say, if I was working something that I really wanted to hide it, I would come down from the edge probably. You do have to be careful if you're adding to the edge because obviously if you have a knot of thread, that can show up at the edge of your button as well. So it's not, 
you know, when you're working large buttons, you just have to accept you're going to have to add thread. And of course, if you're working different colors, you're going to have to accept that you're adding thread. So now it's not a bad idea to try to come up and sort of catch what I'm doing is I'm just catching under that stitch so that I can keep it perfectly in line. Again, you don't need to do that, but if you're worrying about lining up stripes, you might want to do that so that you are starting at the same place as where you finished. Otherwise, it won't be quite so noticeable. And then just carry on. So again, just in case, I come up alongside a spoke, and then I'm going back down, around the spoke, backward, hence rounding back stitch. And then up, and back down around the spoke. So I've caught up and I've gone pretty close to the edge. I know that you can just see, but um, that's pretty good. If you look really closely, you can see one bit where the tension's gone. And that is where I changed the thread. So I'll show you how to, we're gonna fix that in a minute because again, that will bother me. So to finish, some people will finish by going under the ridge at the side. I prefer to take down to the center, as I said before. I just think that it gives a little bit of a better finish to the edge. And that's particularly if my, um, with time, if your thread, if, especially if the button's going to be washed, if the thread starts to fray a bit. If you've got a knot along here, you will see it. It's just like, see there where we've covered over I'll trim that because you can just see it at the edge, that little fuzzy bit. Um, so just an irritant, I guess. So where the, I felt that there wasn't, the tension wasn't quite right, I can go through and actually split the thread and pull down just a little bit. Watch from the front to make sure that you're not pulling too much and you're not pulling the wrong thread because you can obviously cause it to look a little horrible if you pull the wrong thread. And I'm just gonna catch that just to tighten off that little lump that I didn't like. Oop. And then work a little knot. Now, I know that there are some people who will leave that tail on and say, that's it, stitch that onto your garment using that tail. Don't. If you need to, make another knot, but finish that tail, cut it off. Old buttons did not have little tails so that people could sew them on. They were finished, complete items, that were carded up just as we would expect to see buttons carded now. And so therefore, that's what you want to provide. And the reason being is that if you provide it like that, you know that your pretty button can be removed if need be so that somebody can keep it and it can be in a collector's box in years to come. So if you use the same tail that you've used as your covering, somebody goes to snip that, they could snip all of your work. There we have it, one large dorset wheel that rather looks like a cross section of a watermelon. So we add some black spots on there, you've got a watermelon dorset button. <laughs> I hope that made things clearer for you. I will pop the link to the original um, video down in the description box below. So now let's get started on the next button, which is a traditional design called a pinwheel. To make the pinwheel, I've used a smaller ring. And of course, the number of wraps that we lay 
are important because it's a pattern. So for this pattern, we need to lay four for eight. So one, two, three, four. Now, my spacing is a little out there. So what you can do if you need to line up any of your spacing is just take your needle gently and tweak them around. This is sometimes easier to do once you've centered. Sometimes it's more difficult to do once you've centered. So it's just a matter of practice and seeing what you need to do. That's a very big gap there. So if like me, I've decided, no, actually that gap's a little bit too uneven. That's before I've gone into doing too much centering. I'm gonna start again. And you see, there's been no harm done. And I think that, that it's important for people to realize that they can, you know, start again, not a problem. Getting things lined up first time isn't going to be easy, especially not when you're working the larger rings. It's a bit easier on the smaller ones, I will admit. That's much better. Even at a funny angle, I can see that that's better. So I'm gonna pop some cross stitches in and get this squared up, centered, just as before pulling down a little and because there's only four wraps it can be a little bit difficult to get that centered and just make it center because obviously your spokes are going over a larger area there we have it and then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to as before just catch under those threads to try to hold that centering in place. That's just something I do. I know that a, quite a few button makers don't do that. I like to, to fasten it. Stops me worrying too much when I'm happy with it. Now, for the pinwheel, this is a little bit different because what you're going to do is you're going to weave. So just in case I didn't explain it, the four is the four wraps, the, and a wrap goes from the end of the ring to the edge of the ring. The spoke is what comes out from the center, so we now have eight spokes, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now what you need to do for this traditional design is basically weave. So I'm gonna come up alongside a spoke, go in, We're gonna basically concentrate on this triangle, okay? So I'm gonna come up the side and go back down at the center. And then up, center. And carry on like this, keeping your tension as good as you can to fill in that triangle but don't pull so tight as you pull the triangle because you want it to fan out so that it creates um, an actual triangular shape you don't want to distort it if you can help it and so again back to my finger behind it to help hold those stitches in the place where i want them to be I am at a little bit of a funny angle to actually see what I'm doing. So I'm hoping it will be clear for you to see. And I'm just going to weave from the center out. Now I'm gonna slightly change my position so that I can actually see what I'm doing and make sure that I'm happy with how this is turning out. Because I think it's very important um, on the pinwheel 
to make sure that you get your tension as good as you possibly can because that will give you nice even um, fan sections. Now I've got a nice kink there and that's because I didn't hold up my thread so as before just hold up my thread and let it spin a little. It's not as bad doing the weaving but you do still get some kinks. Just unthreaded my needle then. A lot of people ask me what needle that I use. I tend to use a um, size 22 tapestry needle thereabouts, but whatever's most comfortable. Tapestry needles are usually a little bit easier, but if you've got to cross under uh, if your pattern calls for a lot of crossing underneath ridges and so on, you might want to go for um, a cruel. Just basically whatever works best for you. So there's that blade woven. And we need to get back to the center. Now you could just go straight back to the center, but it's quite nice if you go underneath to the center that can help give a nice finish. But of course it does depend on if your needle is the right size to go underneath. And if it isn't, don't worry about it. Don't distort your stitches. And then I'm gonna come up and we're gonna skip. So there's the one blade skip a triangle and work the next blade in exactly the same way. So that ultimately we'll work around and we'll have four blades. So I shall carry on doing that. And of course, adding a thread on this one is really easy because you can just easily go back to the center. You could do every blade a different color if you wanted to. There we have it, a simple little pinwheel button, just with the uh, weaving back and forth. At the back, I've just fastened at the center, and as you can see with the three extra blades that I um, did the weaving on, I decided to just go straight to the back because I felt that my needle was a little too fat to go right the way underneath. It pulled the stitches a bit, but there you have it. That would look nice doing um, the pinwheels in different colors. It'd be nice and bright and summery to go with our watermelon, I guess. <laughs> Thanks very much for watching. You can find these buttons and many more in my Dorset Ring Buttons book. And if you are enjoying these videos, do please click like, hit subscribe. Let me know what else you'd like to see in the comments um, or just stop by and say hi. Take care of yourselves until the next time. Bye-bye.